Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fies from Central New Mexico Community College, and in this video E on the heart, we are going to move towards microscopic anatomy, which is going to get us ready for the physiology of the heart. In Anatomy and Physiology Part 1, you learned in great detail about skeletal muscle tissue, which is a striated muscle tissue. Remember how the striations are formed based on the arrangements of the thick and the thin filaments. Well, cardiac muscle tissue is quite similar to skeletal muscle tissue, so I'm going to make a lot of assumptions here with regards to not just the microscopic anatomy knowledge that you gained in AMP1, but in future videos also um, what you remember from skeletal muscle physiology. So just like skeletal muscle tissue, heart muscle tissue or cardiac muscle tissue is also striated. If you look here at the arrangement of the thick and thin filaments, you can clearly see the A bands and the lighter I bands and the A bands and the lighter I bands uh, creating the striations. We see mitochondria, um, which we see in skeletal muscle cells or, or yeah, in skeletal muscle fibers as well. One of the main, or a few of the main differences between cardiac and skeletal muscle tissue, we can already see on these particular diagrams. And let's first of all take a look at this top diagram, which gives you an overall view of how the cells um, look together. And right off the bat, you should recognize that the cells do not look like they did in skeletal muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle fibers are these long, skinny cylinders, right? And they sit sort of side by side, like so. And they're striated, of course. Right? Notice that our cardiac muscle cells are very branchy. So they're not these long, long cylinders, skinny cylinders. Skeletal muscle cells also had many nuclei per cell. Their cells were really long, sometimes up to a foot long. And therefore, we saw that the cells were um, multinucleated. That is not the case in heart muscle tissue, where we typically only see one nucleus per cell. We can also see that the cells of heart muscle are interconnected, interestingly. You see these little zigzag lines that indicate the connections between the cells. And we refer to these membrane junctions in heart muscle as intercalated discs. It's spelled out for you there. You can see them not very well on this slide, but here and there you see them. Uh, there are these darker vertical uh, connections between individual cells. These intercalated discs are made up of two specialized membrane junctions, and that is desmosomes, which are these zipper-like uh, connections that allow for the muscle cells to stay connected even though they might be pulled and tugged on um, as the heart fills with blood and stretches. But inside of these intercalated discs, we also find gap junctions. And this is what really, really separates the heart muscle from skeletal muscle, because gap junctions allow for all kinds of ions to travel from cell to cell. So ions can travel from cell 1 to cell 2 through these gap junctions. This makes heart muscle tissue electrically connected. By that I mean the following. If depolarization occurs in one cell, then because the ions that are forming this um, electrical current can now move into the next cell, these ions can move, that are creating depolarization can move into the next cell, that leads to depolarization of the next cell. So the cells are said to be electrically connected. Skeletal muscle cells, on the other hand, are said to be electrically isolated. That being said, if, iso if, if depolarization occurs in, 
this cell, that depolarization only spreads throughout this skeletal muscle fiber. It will not make it into this muscle fiber. Skeletal muscle cells are electrically isolated. This is one of the reasons for why each and every skeletal muscle cell needed its own axonal terminal because these cells are electrically separate. Not the case for heart muscle, obviously, because if one cell is, is triggered, the next cell can be triggered as well. There are many more differences, and I'm providing you here with a couple of tables that summarize these differences. And I'm, I'm going to point out some of the important things. You do need to know all features listed here. But notice, for instance, that cardiac muscle tissue has many, many, many more mitochondria compared to skeletal muscle tissue. And that is because heart muscle tissue cannot really do without oxygen. Consequently, we see that aerobic metabolism is really only what occurs in heart mus muscle, while skeletal muscle can create ATP by means of aerobic metabolism as well as glycolysis followed by lactic acid fermentation. Another huge difference between these two muscle tissues is that the somatic nervous system, the voluntary nervous system, is what innervates each and every skeletal muscle cell in skeletal muscle tissue. That is not the case in cardiac muscle tissue. In cardiac muscle tissue, we will see that some of the muscle cells have become modified into what we call pacemaker cells, and they, they can actually set the wave of depolarization. In addition to that, we see that our um, heart muscle tissue is also innervated by the autonomic nervous system. We'll talk more about that. The last row here where it says responding cells, remember that each skeletal muscle cell must receive its own axonal terminal and consequently those muscle cells that receive stimuli from axonal terminals are only going to be the ones that will um, contract. While in the case of the heart, the moment some cells have become depolarized, the depolarization spreads and therefore all cells of the heart will ultimately contract. So the heart acts as what we call a syncytium. And if you translate this term, we have CYT referring to cell and syn meaning together. So all the cells work together to create the contraction. This next table might not make a whole lot of sense to you until you have studied the physiology of the heart. So I encourage you to come back uh, to studying this table after you've learned about um, heart physiology. I'll point out just a few things for now, um, and that is you're going to see that the length of an action potential in the heart is much more extensive because we're going to see that it's not going to be just sodium ions that play a role in triggering the depolarization, uh, but also calcium. And consequently, we also see a longer length of contractions. Remember, too, that the, the way that we create these smooth contractions in our skeletal muscle that we have full control over so that we can pick up something really light or we can pick up a heavy table, um, because of that, we have um, wave summation occurring and motor unit recruitment ultimately leading to tetanic contractions, full contractions of our muscles full graded contractions, I should say. This does not happen in the heart. Um, our heart must regularly relax, otherwise it would not be able to act as a pump. And then we've mentioned some of the other things already. Um, finally, the endomesium of the heart muscle is actually loose connective tissue. Remember, that's the connective tissue that wraps itself around each muscle cell. 
in skeletal muscle tissue that tends to be dense connective tissue. So this wraps up the microscopic anatomy of the heart as well as, well as prior to that the external anatomy and blood flow. And so we're finally ready to dive into the physiology of the heart.